Any apologies for absence? I just heard mm -hmm. one. Thank you, Chair. Apologies from councillors Peter Black and Mike White. Right. Any others? No. Okay, thanks. Next item then, item two, any disclosures of personal and prejudicial interest? Any? No. There are none. Item three is the uh, to approve and sign the minutes of the previous meeting as a correct record. And so you're going to find those on pages one to four. So go to page one. Two. Page three. And page four. It's been moved as a correct record. Thank you. So item four, any items for deferral or withdrawal? No, Jack. None. Thank you. So then we move on to the next item, which is item five, is the uh, tree preservation order at a uh, rectory cottage in Elston. That's all to you. Are. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Uh, it's a report for the to consider the uh, confirmation of TPO 691 at rectory cottage Elston. Served on the 19th of December 2023. It was served in response to a notification from the tree's owner that they intended to remove the tree. It stands in a conservation area. So the only way to control the work is by the council putting a preservation order on the tree. Um, we've received two uh, objections to the order, uh, one from the owner and one from uh, a neighbouring property. Um, and they're summarised in, in my report. We've received uh, an additional representation um, from the neighbour, um, which talks about uh, the method that we use to score trees uh, called TEMPO, which is Tree Evaluation Method for Preservation Orders. Um, and I was going to just break that down to show where the score of 19 has come from. So the first thing is we consider is the condition of the tree and it's in good condition. So that scores the highest mark of five. Secondly is the life expectancy. Um, uh, hornbeams have a life expectancy anywhere between sort of 50 to 150 years, but you know, beyond that also. So you know, I've scored it 40 to 100 years because it's estimated to be 30 to 40 years old at present, which I think is, uh, is reasonable. And then on to visibility. So it's a on the um, on the scoring system. Um, the best descriptor of it is a large medium tree clearly visible to the public, which scores again a four. So so those together look at the amenity value of the tree. Next. Uh, factor that's looked at is um, are there any other factors that give importance to the tree, such as uh, veteran or historic value or, or something like that? And it doesn't, so it only scores one on that um, scoring part of the system. And then the last part is the expediency. Um, so, do we need to serve a TPO? Um, and because we'd had notification that the tree was going to be removed, it's, it's, it is expedient. It's, you know, we know the tree will be removed without doing so. So again, that scores at the top of that value of five. So that, that comes to 19. Um, which in, in the system, that definitely merits a TPO. Um, the objector also mentions the, the size of the tree um, and the well, the potential size of the tree can grow up to sort of 30 meters in ideal conditions. Um, it can be pruned. You know, we we can deal with an application to prune the tree, keep it in a reasonable condition um, in in, it, in its location. Um, it's it's sat in the garden. It's an open grown tree. It it contributes quite significantly to the local visual amenity, in, in my opinion. So uh, I'd like you to consider um, the recommendation of um, making it um, confirmed. Thank you. Thank you very much. And but we do have two uh, speakers wishing to address us this afternoon. It's Mr. Gordon and Mr. Cool, yeah. So 
I understand you've been told you've got your five minutes between you. Yep. OK, so when you're ready, if you'd like to speak, please. Uh, thank you, Chair and members of the Planning Committee for the opportunity to address you direct. Uh, my name is Richard Gordon and I live at Ilston Green, the property next to Rectory Cottage and a property directly impacted by the tree, which is the subject of this TPO. Um, some 30 to 40 years ago, my former neighbour at Rectory Cottage planted a sapling tree in the boundary between our properties. I can confidently say that had he and I known of the scale and dominance of this tree in the years to come, he would have moved it to another more appropriate part of his garden. The tree grew gently and unimposingly at first and with a confined spread that did not encroach on my garden. But in the last 15 years or so, the tree has increased in height and span significantly. And latterly, it has become overwhelming in its proportions. Its branches are now six foot away from touching my property and getting closer uh, year on year. Its growth potential would make it, in my view, unacceptably large um, for this specific, uh, specific site. A fine tree, but a tree in the wrong place. A tree where my admiration of it uh, has become tainted by the maintenance problems it causes me, and dare I say the ongoing anxiety it causes me too. I live in a valley close to a river where the prospects of flooding are very real concern and stormwater needs to be managed. Keeping gutters, drains and paths clear is not for me just a cosmetic nicety, it is a maintenance priority essential to ensuring water runs away quickly and effectively. The leaf and catkin fall from this tree, given the prevailing wind from the southwest, brings most of it in my direction and deposits it um, on paths, gutters and the central roof rally in ever increasing quantities as the tree gets larger and larger and larger year on year. The catkins in particular fall in such a quantity that if left they form a tight matted surface that blocks whatever type of gutter guard uh, I, I try to use to, to prevent it happening. I find it to be extremely dismissive where in the report essential maintenance in my case is brushed aside in the appraisal as not considered an onerous task. It certainly is and certainly is at my age. This shows a complete lack of awareness of the work involved and an understanding and empathy for my situation as an individual. Ideally, I would wish to see the tree move to a more appropriate location, which of course is unrealistic. My next preference would be for the tree to be felled and replaced um, by trees planted in appropriate location, which does not appear to me to be see, seen to be um, by me to be an unreasonable option. Following that, a reduction in the size of the tree with a combined uh, regular pruning would be preferable to the current uh, arrangement where it's left to grow larger and larger year on year. For me, the tree presents as an unwelcome visitor who will not leave. Uh, my efforts to create a pleasant environment and an easier lifestyle from, for me at my time of life significantly is undermined by its presence and ever increasing dominance. Given the number and variety of trees surrounding our properties, in my opinion, there would be no significant detriment to the character of the area or significant loss of amenity if this tree was not there, especially if it was replaced by new planting in more appropriate locations. But most importantly, a TPO is not necessary. It cannot be argued that it is expedient to enforce this TPO, as despite on my very real misgivings, the tree is not under threat and there's no evidence to the contrary. In fact, Mr. Coode, my neighbour, has gone about approaching this matter in the correct and proper way by contacting the council before considering any work on the tree itself. And there's been no prior attempt to damage or remove the tree or to have any branches lopped. I would urge members, therefore, not to agree to the application for a TPO in this instance. Thank you. Yeah, hi. Uh, thank you as well. My name's Chris Coode and I own Rectory Cottage where the tree is situated. I'm, of course, in agreement with Richard on all matters regarding this TPO. 
A conservation area is an area of special architectural or historic interest. This tree was planted approximately 40 years ago, but the buildings it surrounds around it are hundreds of years old. This horn tree will, uh, hornbeam tree will grow to double what it is now in height and in width. The photo which you see in this picture here is from Google Earth. This was taken approximately 12 years ago. I've got photos on my uh, phone that I'm more than happy to show you taken today. And you'll see that is not representative of the hornbeam tree that you're looking at today. That is a misrepresentation, which I do not enjoy at all. I understand and rightly so that you, the council, place particular importance on preserving an area. This includes the dwellings and not just the environment. The livability of what we're living in has to be taken into account. This hornbeam removal would benefit my neighbour's property and to help conserve it. Removal of this one tree from my garden does not take away from the amenity of the area, as I have a further several differing varieties of trees, three of which are behind this hornbeam. I would replace this tree not with saplings, I would use standard trees to replace it, not the saplings as in the report by Alan Webster. In short, I do not agree with the assessment of Alan Webster and the tree removal would not harm the environment and the local amenity. To get the balance of trees, people and dwellings correct, I urge you not to enforce this cumbersome TPO. That's it. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you both. I've got first uh, speakers, Councillor Keaton, and then Councillor Lewis. Yeah. Oh, okay. All right, okay, thanks. Thank you. Councillor Keaton. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, I just had a few questions because I'm not sure. I've just been Googling it desperately while uh, I were talking. Um, how much carbon storage for the hornbeam as a fully matured tree as opposed to even smaller trees being planted is a big question on my front. The other is if there is already flooding problems, aren't they going to get a lot worse if we have a mature tree removed? Um, both concerns for me. Thank you. Okay, hey, thank you so much. Um, Councillor Lewis. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I actually, uh, I feel I understand where these two gentlemen are coming from. It's not as if in Gal we are short of trees. That's one thing we have plenty of. And I think that if if this is correct, what the gentleman's I'm sure is, that this picture is out of date. I, I don't think that's appropriate to, to, to show us, um, to, to, to see it. But I think that as far as I'm concerned, um, people come before trees in my view. We've got plenty. It's not as if we're short of trees. Uh, this is an odd tree I've never heard of before, and I will probably never ever see it either. But as far as I'm concerned, I think when it affects people's houses or their homes, uh, I would certainly, I will be voting against uh, this uh, TBO order. Yeah, just uh, just mentioning the leaves and the catkins. Well, I think every ward gets that complaint at the same time every year. So I'm expecting mine to come in any any minute now from the same people. Um, that's just what happens when there's, when there's trees around. Um, I like trees, but there are, are right places to put trees and the wrong places. Personally, if this was for sale, I wouldn't buy it because the tree would put me off. Um, the other thing is, but you can answer that the people now who own this tree, they could keep it at a reasonable height by coming in and getting permission to block whatever they want to do. So they could do that. Um, 
and the photo is 13 years ago. I don't like to update date photo, although that, that means the tree would disappear off this photo. Um, also, if this TPO is, is agreed, how do we then inspect this tree? Because I've had uh, an inspector come out, he was not here today, which says you can inspect a tree today and it'll fall down tomorrow because he can't see what's happening inside the tree. So, um, you know, has this got to be inspected every two years, three years? And if it's not, and it comes down, who's, whose responsibility is it? Um, and yes, this uh, this one is only 30, 40. I think that's it at the moment. And then yes, I'll come back. Thank you. Councillor Mary Jones. Oh, <clears throat> thank you, Chair. Um, well, one of my questions, Sarah Keaton's already asked, which is about would it ex exacerbate the flooding because a mature tree does take much more water. I must admit I'd forgotten about the carbon uh, capture, but yes, I do agree with that. Um, yes, I have some sympathy because where I live, there's an awful lot of trees and we're either brushing them or, you know, clearing our gutters. So, um, that's the problem. We are the custodians of the trees. And uh, Councillor Richard Lewis, if you go to Singleton Park, they've just been planting hornbeams because they're a native species. And uh, they're trying to obviously uh, well, continue uh, trees for, you know, our, past our lifetime. Um, I do have some sympathy with uh, the gentleman. And yes, one of my questions was, could we have a, the photograph on the screen? Because looking at it like on a small piece of paper or on a tablet, you can't actually appreciate the size. But I understand the gentleman that owns the cottage has better photographs than the one we've been provided with. And I was trying to work out how far is the tree from the actual uh, dwellings that we are talking about uh, because well you're all, it's well known I actually always support trees except when a massive one's just about to be put in a tiny garden but apart from that I always try and fight for uh, trees now the picture we've got here doesn't show what I would like to see um, should we have a site visit to go and look at it I don't know um, perhaps somebody would support me if I called for a site visit, because I think it's really, really important that we know, um, you know what we're talking about and not what we're trying to look at as an image, because at the moment it's obviously not got any leaf on it and we just don't know what the size is. Uh, it's quite, um, you can't tell in the winter really, the um, the actual, what the tree, uh, well, the, the green canopy is. So. I think I'll call for a site visit and see what happens. I got Felix, Mike, Councillor Lewis, Mike Lewis, and Mark, is it? Yeah. Uh, yes. Uh, hello, Alan. Could you confirm that if if the committee were to grant this TPO today, would the owner of the property be able to apply to lop this tree at some time in the future? Mm. Yes, and and it's likely to be approved. Um, you know, suitable pruning in, done in accordance with the British standard. Uh, the, the trouble is, if if it's removed, if 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 it's removed without a TPO on it, we 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 have no control, so we can't have replacements. So so if it does become a pro a problem in ten fifteen years, um, and does actually start causing structural damage and we then agree to re for its removal we can then condition a replacement as well so we there's more control with, with the conservation area there's there's very little control the only control we have is to put a tpo on it and that's that's the reason for the tpo yeah thanks for your report i, I did read it in depth um and i understand that this particular tree uh is very good for uh, conserving um, animals, small mammals and birds, because it provides a lot of shelter and and food for them during the winter months. Um, and as I'm on the horns of a dilemma here, because we we are, although I, I'm, I'm quite 
au fait with what, what, what the owner has said and his neighbour has said, and I, I can understand it from their point of view. We, as a council, we've agreed to a, a climate and nature emergency. Um, and just the loss of one tree uh, here and one tree there, it, it adds up through, throughout the whole uh, county. So um, given that you, you, you've uh, given us the marks for tempo and it's way above uh, what we deem as a, a, a tree that wouldn't be uh, uh, given a TPO. Um, I'm 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 still on the fence, but <laughs> it's it, that, that's where I am with it at the moment. But uh, thanks for listening. Thank you. No, I understand. Thank you, uh, Councillor Tribe. Thanks so much, Chair. Um, two points. I agree wholeheartedly with uh, Councillor Jones. A site visit, I think, would be in order. I also agree with Councillor Lewis, um, as we have dealt with many previous developments, where the developers have have. Um, have cut the trees down, but they have replaced them, which is an offer now. So as far as I'm concerned, the, if the precedent has been set, really, we can't allow major developers to cut trees down and then turn individuals down, in, in my opinion. Thank you. Hey, thank you. Um, Councillor Keaton, did you want to come back in? Yes, yeah, sorry, sorry, Chair. Just to say, as far as Wales is concerned, we are low on trees and Gower has already just started planting a new wood, allegedly, because of the lack of trees. And mature trees are important. It's awful that they're planted where you're not enjoying them the way you should be able to. And it would be good a site visit because it is hard to tell from this. I'm hoping we could lop some branches off, perhaps perhaps cut it back. I don't know, I'm not a tree person, but if we could get that advice. I'm loath to get rid of the whole tree though because of the amount of carbon is captured. And it's even without leaves, it's a gorgeous thing. So, you know, there we go. Sorry, wearing my heart on my sleeve. I do apologize to the gentleman because it must be frustrating. But if you plant other trees, I don't think we should even leave the major um, builders take away fully grown trees because planting smaller trees you don't capture a fraction of the carbon and the chance and the thing is as time's running out we won't they won't reach the maturity they need to before we need that help so i think it's better to leave it standing thank you i will not speak again <laughs> okay thank you right i got no one else no let's come back again no Alan, did you want to speak? Yes, thank you, thank you, Chair. I think I quite agree with uh, Councillor Jones and Tribe about a site visit on this. I'm looking at a picture here, which is probably more recent than the one that's in the um, in, in the document that we receive. Uh, and a site visit will give us, a, I think, a better perspective as to where that tree lies in, in relation to the property. Because looking at this one here, the branches are almost touching the property. So. Mm. Uh, I, I feel that the, the the owners do have a case here uh, of concern, but um, other than that, wait, we know that the, the the tree itself is a habitat for for birds and and, and mammals and so forth and, and insects. And I think at one time in years gone by, it was uh, it was used for herbal herbal medicine. But um, I think those days are long past now. But uh, but yes, I think um, a site visit would give us a better perspective as to where that is. Thank you, Chair. Do you want to come back in? Well, Chairman, what surprised me is that uh, we put before us a, a picture which is 12 years old. I mean, you know, surely somebody would have gone down and seen what was there. That was the time to take a picture, not give us, uh, you know, 12 years ago. I, I just don't think that's good enough, to be honest with you. I mean, it, it it does raise with me why why twelve years? Do you mean to say we haven't got the facilities here to send somebody down with a phone or or a camera and take a picture? I I, I just think it's to me, it's not the way of doing business. Okay, thank you for that. Did you want to come back in? Arthur? Yeah, the chair. Um, the picture on the screen at the moment is the picture that was supplied by. Um, the tree's owner, when he notified us, he wanted to cut it down. So that's quite recent.
Yeah. Yes, that's right. But that's to show where it is. It's, it gives context. Did, was there anything else you wanted to add on? OK, um, well, somebody's moved it and seconded a, a site visit. So we have to deal with that first. It, did you want? Yeah, did. Shall we take a vote on that in first? Before we please. OK, we're going to do a vote on the site, uh, site visit. Uh, Councillor Phil Downen. Against. Councillor Alan Jeffrey. For. Councillor Mary Jones. For. Councillor Sarah Keaton. For. Councillor Mike Lewis. For. Councillor Richard Lewis. Against. Councillor Nicola Matthews. For. Councillor Mark Tribe. For. Councillor Williams. Four. And Councillor Lloyd. Okay, four. Thank you. Okay, that's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, four, so, two against. Okay. All right. Okay. So we'll do that first and then bring the bring it back on the next agenda. All being well. Yeah. Okay. Thank you for that. And um, next item on our agenda, then you see on um, Page 14 is item one for, for item, agenda item six. Is that over at uh, Felin Vran? And it's Simon, it's over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Chair. Uh, there are no updates for this application, so I'll just go straight into the presentation. Uh, the application is reported to committee as the number of dwellings proposed would exceed the committee threshold as set out in the Council's constitution. Uh, there is planning history at this site, uh, and this is detailed within the officer report. The key permissions relate to the 2007 permission for 26 dwellings, which has expired, and a 2020 outline planning permission for the construction of 20 dwellings, view access road and replacement bridge. This outline permission remains extant. The application has been subject to extended discussions with the LPA. Uh, hence why this application has a 2021 reference number. So it's it's been in some time um, as a result of ongoing discussions. Uh, yeah, Ian, if you just show the first slide, thanks. Um, this is a full planning application for the construction of 20 dwellings and a replacement bridge. As with the outline permission, access to the site would be derived off Walters Road via a bridge span, spanning the Namp Bran, which is proposed to be replaced. Uh, as you can see from the, the image on the slide, uh, the site itself is loco located between Tregov Village um, to the southwest and Park Brynhylog to the northeast. You could just show the second slide, Ian, which is a sort of zoomed up. So um, access will be gained off Felin Vran, uh, which is an adopted road that currently serves three dwellings and connects to Walters Road. The site is located between the M4 to the east and network rail land to the west. Uh, the site, the centre of the site is broadly shown as a cross on that image. Um, the access um, off to Valenbran off Walters Road is indicated with the, the arrow. So that's the access uh, into the site. The site's currently vacant, although there are some temporary structures in the southern part of the site, which can be seen uh, on the southern part of the aerial image. The vegetation at the site was cleared for the most part several years ago, but is now revegetated. So the, the, the aerial image you can see there is, is um, shortly after it was cleared by the looks of it. Uh, the key natural features at the site are the surrounding trees bordering the M4 and the railway embankment. There's a high pressure gas main that runs through the site. Ian, if you could just show the next slide. So that's the application site red line boundary. So it's in a regular shape and picks up the access off Felon Bran and then the main body of the site, which is located between the N4 and the railway bridge. Ian, if you could show the next slide. Uh, so the, the top image shows the access. Uh, is it, this top image, image is taken from Walters Road and it shows the access um, off Felin Bran. Um, the arrow there indicates the existing bridge over the Nant Bran, which is proposed to be replaced. And if you've got a 
good pair of eyes, you'll see that the sign there in the uh, foreground says weak bridge, so uh, hence the need to replace it. Uh, the lower image is actually taken from Felinbran, um, and that shows the three houses which uh, are currently sited on the road. Um, in terms of consultations, the application was advertised in the press by site notices and neighbour letters. Letters have been received from two objectors, raising concerns principally in relation to highway matters, residential amenity concerns and environmental concerns. These, these issues are set out and addressed within the officer report. The key LDP policies that are relevant to the consideration of this proposal are PS2, which is the general placemaking and place management policy, together with the topic specific policies relating to highway safety, flooding and the environment generally. The planning policy framework for the development also includes the National Development Framework, Future Wales, Planning Policy Wales, Technical Advice Notes and Adopted Supplementary Planning Guidance as referenced within the officer report. The main issues in terms of the consideration of the application is where the submitted scheme would accord with national planning policies and LDP policies in relation to the principle of the development, placemaking, impacts upon residential amenity, highway safety, flooding, affordable housing and the environment generally. In terms of the principle of the development, the application site is white land within the LDP. There were initially concerns when the outline planning application was considered in relation to the isolated nature of the site. However, it was considered on balance that the connections to the development were acceptable, particularly having regard to the proximity of the Swansea Vale strategic site to the west, um, which is considered under LDP policy SDI. While comprehensive proposals for the Swansea Vale strategic site have not been forthcoming to date, the planning policy position in relation to the scheme remains much the same as when the outline planning permission was granted. And importantly, that permission remains extant. It's therefore considered that the principle of residential development on the site has been established under LDP policies, and this remains the case now. If you could go to the next slide here, which shows the, um, the zoom, that, sorry, if you go to the next one. So that that, um, that slide that's in front of you now shows the, the entire site, including the access and the linear residential development that's proposed. In terms of placemaking and residential amenity, the proposed access to the site would follow the alignment of Vellinbran before diverting to create a spine street that would meander through the site, terminating in a turning head. Ian, if you go to the next slide, which is a zoomed in version showing the housing. Frontage development is proposed on one side of the street comprising of detached, semi-detached and terraced dwellings, with all dwellings facing east, northeast direction towards the M4. An amenity area would be created on the opposite side of the street with landscaping, suds features and a small lo local area of play to serve the future residents. Ian, if you could show the street scene in the next slide. A range of two storey house types are proposed with three and four bed units with side drive parking. A mix of render and brick finishes are proposed, with brick being the predominant facing material. The placemaking officer is supportive of the scheme, but would like to have seen uh, tree build outs within the street, within the spine street. On reflection, these were not considered necessary given the mature landscaping that already exists within the site and the proposals for further planting within the amenity area that would provide a landscape setting to the development. In terms of residential amenity, as you can see from the site plan, the proposed dwellings are sited some distance from the existing properties. As such, there will be no direct residential amenity impacts upon existing occupiers on Vell and Bran. In terms of the future, future occupiers of the development, the noise report accompanying the application recommends sound insulation measures and an acoustic barrier to screen the development from excessive noise from the motorway. These matters can be addressed by conditions, and the pollution control officer has not objected to the proposal on noise grounds or air quality grounds. 
The internal size of the house types has been assessed against the standards within the pacemaking guidance SPG and are considered to be acceptable. Uh, turning to access and highway safety, in principle, the Highway Authority have not objected to the provision of a replacement bridge to replace the existing weight restricted structure. Bellin Franz, an adopted road, as such, any works to this road, which include proposed improvements and a new bridge, would be subject to a separate Section 278 agreement under the Highways Act. The parking provision for the development is provided at two or three spaces per unit, which is considered to be acceptable having regard to the Swansea Parking Standards SPG. As with the outlined planning permission, a £30,000 contribution to highway improvements and or active travel improvements in the locality is recommended to be secured through a Section 106 agreement. Turning to ecology and trees, uh, the majority of the site is located within the Cumdi Cairo to Birch Grove Railway site of importance for nature conservation and is adjacent to the M4 corridor sink. No protected species were found on the site. For the most part, trees of value on the site are proposed to be retained and where unavoidable losses would occur, compensatory planting is proposed and this would be secured by a condition, as would tree protection measures and ecological enhancements. Turning to flood risk matters, Ian, if you could just put up the next slide. NRW's response refers to TAN 15, which states that highly vulnerable development should not be permitted in flood zone C2. It's acknowledged that part of the site within the vicinity of the bridge is located within a C2 flood zone within TAN 15 development advice maps. The remainder of the site, however, including the housing, is flood free. So on the screen in front of you, you've got the top image, which is the um, NRW's development advice maps associated with TAN 15. Um, so you can see the site to the north um, and the area in blue is the C2 flood zone. So that's the area broadly um, of the site that will be affected is the area around the proposed replacement bridge and the access. The application has been accompanied by information to assess the consequences of flooding at the site. The flooding reports indicate there is a low point on Vellinbran, just to the north of the Namp Bran crossing, where maximum depths during the one in a hundred year plus climate change, the one in a thousand year event, are approximately 700 millimetres and one metre reflect, uh, respectively. In the one in a hundred year event, the site would not be accessible by emergency vehicles for a period of approximately two hours. This would increase to four hours for a one in a thousand year event. Um, you can see in the bottom image um, the, the, the sort of area that would be subject to flooding in the one in a hundred year event. So you can see there um, the access around the, the bridge area is affected. While the development may not strictly comply with the requirements of TAN 15, as the access is not entirely flood free in the one in a hundred year event, and access would be flood flooded to an excessive depths in the one in a thousand year event, on balance, Given the limited period to see access will be inaccessible, the consequences of flooding at the site are considered to be acceptable on balance. Turning to section 106 matters uh, in relation to open space, open space would be provided within the site, including a small local area of play. The Parks Department have requested a contribution for an upgrade to the play facilities at Park Bryn High Log. However, Given the distance from the site to this facility, which is approximately a kilometre, it's not considered that a contribution can be justified in this instance. Um, in terms of education, the education department have sought a contribution towards Kevin Hengoyd Comprehensive School, uh, as the development would generate a requirement for three pupil places. However, reference to capacity figures at this school indicates that the development would not take the school over its capacity. As such, it is not considered a contribution would be justified in this instance. This is the same position as when the application was previously considered in 2020 for the outline planning application. In terms of affordable housing, the proposal would generate a policy requirement for 10% on-site affordable housing. It's therefore recommended that two social rented units should be secured through a Section 106 agreement. 
Other matters relating to drainage, land contamination and the high pressure gas main have all been dealt with within the officer report, having regard to the advice of consultees and are considered to be acceptable in accordance with LDP policies. Overall, therefore, on balance, the scheme is recommended for approval, subject to conditions and subject to securing planning obligations through a Section 106 agreement, as referenced in the officer report. Thank you, Chair. Thank you for that, Simon. Very thorough report. Um, can I see anyone wish to speak? Oh, Councillor Lewis. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, yes, I was a member of the planning committee four years ago when this came before us, this plot of land came before us. Yeah. Um, and uh, I was concerned then, and I'm concerned now, as to the mains gas pipeline that runs under this land. Uh, I just hope that the officer can assure me that everything had been done uh, to look at the safety aspects of it, because when I look at the plan that's been put before us this, uh, today, it, it, most of the houses seem to be running straight across the pipeline. I, I it, it wasn't shown on the plan, so I, I don't know, but I, it is a serious concern to me, uh, that particular issue. Other than that, I, I see no reason why I should vote against it, but it's right. it. Yeah. Thank you very much, Chair. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I'm not against this in any shape or form. Um, but what I can read, I was, was concerned about the bridge, but reading it again, I think everything's been covered about, about the bridge. And it does say that there's a pavement, a footway along one side. And then it says this should be maintained throughout the development as a minimum. So are we saying that there's only one footpath throughout this site? And if so, then explain why. The other thing is, it, this tickled me a bit because it's been brought up on many uh, planning applications. Uh, paragraph 3.21, and it says the planning system must consider the impacts of new development on existing communities and max and maximise health protection and well-being and safeguarding amenities. This will include considering the provision. I stop on that because I don't want you to mention. I could just go on and access, but I don't need to stick on the access to community and health assets such as community halls, libraries. Doctor surgeries. Well, every time we mention doctor surgeries here, we are told not to be considered and um, with planning. So why is this in the and it says hospitals, but uh, um, we, we didn't put schools in because we can do that with a 106. So can you explain why we put surgeries in this particular paragraph? And it jumped out at me. Well done. Well done. Otherwise, everything's OK. Okay, thank you. I got Councillor Keaton. Next. I think Mary Jones is Councillor Mary Jones is before me. Okay, then. Uh, Councillor Mary Jones and then Councillor Keaton. Okay, thank you. Oh, thank you. We're probably going to say very much the same thing. Um, I have major concerns about this, actually, not just the pipeline. It's not the most ideal of sites to be uh, sandwiched between the M4 and the railway. Um, I noticed they're talking about the acoustic barrier but I wanted to really know how far it was from the properties um, the barrier is going to be erected. And also it said about side parking and on the uh, uh, you know uh, image we were shown, uh, there's trees along the side or in their back garden, you couldn't quite tell. And how many cars can you get at the side? Um, it, it just looked like, well, just a row of houses with not a lot of room uh, between them, especially if neighbours are parking side by side. So I was a bit concerned about that. And also I couldn't find anything in the uh, report to say about public transport. I don't know if I've missed it. I could obviously saw about active travel and you can catch you, you can take your bike to somewhere so that you can get on a, a bus, I thought is what I read. So that's why I was a little bit concerned. Um, I'm not happy about the site. It looks as if it's been pushed in, which it has. And to be honest, um, we all know the rainfall we've had recently, and it may not even be one in a hundred years that we're going to have the flooding. And if people can't get on and off uh, their site, 
it's going to be very difficult. If you've got children in school, you can't wait two hours to go and pick them up while the water subsides and that's it for an emergency vehicle. So what about a household car? I am extremely concerned about this site and I honestly don't think it's the right place to put housing. But well, we'll see what happens when others have spoken. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Keaton. Yes, um, I think Mary's covered a lot of it, but yes, it's hold my hat. Um, there's so many things wrong with this site. I mean, I know it's got a bad name for itself, the sort of 15 minute towns or whatever. But the reality is the reason why people keep talking about that is accessibility and allows people to have a quality of life, even when they don't have a car. And a lot of people don't drive when they're older. And it means getting to a doctor's surgery. So I'm glad you picked that one up. And, and getting to a school without getting to getting in a car is it's a good thing. It's a good thing because it allows people of different ages to get about. This area seems to be sort of shoehorned in somewhere. And I know we're desperate for homes. We are desperate for homes. But and the other thing is the hundred year flooding thing. I think that's probably now every five years, is it? And it's getting worse. I mean, I'm, I'm just looking out now and it's dry at the moment. But how long has it been dry over April or March? Uh, we, we've really got to rethink these things, folks. We really do. I, I don't know what sort of suds they're going to have. I dread to think the size the depth of the hole that's going to needed to engulf that much rainwater is going to be vast. Thank you. <laughs> just just knowing the area well, there's uh, two bus services at the bottom of the road, uh, the Swansea Enterprise Park, uh, schools all around, um, churches, you name it. So that's well covered. Thank you, Councillor Lewis. Gower, it's an occurrence, and as I say, you know, we've lived there. It's not, it's not recent. We've had, we've had flooding in Gower since I've been down there, you know. And the other day, I took my jag through there. It, did, it was slightly over the bonnet, so you know, it, it, these things happen. And I just worry. I was up in London the other day, and I was uh, in one of the areas there. The railway embankment was like down the end, halfway down the road. The noise from the trains and everything, and yet they get on. They, uh, L London thrives. The moment property prices in London are going through the roof, and the nearer you are to a train station, the, 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 the more expensive the house gets. And here we are worried about flooding. I, I just don't understand it. So these days, we've got builders here which will build, providing they're not at below sea level, carry on. Thank you, Chairman. Councillor Tripe, thank you, Pardon. Thank you, Chair. It's just for confirmation. I think I know the area. I think it, uh, the access is off Eolas, he Birch Grove. The actual exit road, would that link up uh, with the road outside Tiagor Village on the way to Anastawi Park? But that's a pretty narrow road there again, if it is, and another bridge. So basically, does the exit road link up with the road outside Teagore Village in Birch Grove? Simon, anything else? Nobody else wants to speak, no? Two things there, wasn't there? Accident. Yeah. Yeah, OK, I'll, I'll try and cover those off as, as best I can. Um, in terms of the gas pipeline, um, we have to consult uh, statutory consultee within certain consultation distances of um, high pressure gas mains or you know, potentially explosive installations. So in this case, we as a local planning authority had to consult the health and safety executive, um, which we have done, um, and they have not um, not advised against um, approving the development. They, they're, they're satisfied um, with the development. We've also consulted Wales and West Utilities who operate that pipeline, and they have not objected to the application, um, subject to the developer contacting them to discuss the, the construction arrangements. So, I mean, as a, as a local planning authority, that, that's all we can do, really. We can be guided by 
by the advice that we have from our statutory consultees. So, yeah, there's been no objection from the HSE or the pipeline operator. OK. Um, in relation to the, the footpath query um, for the site, Ian, could you you put up the um, perhaps the 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 first image showing the whole site? That it's going to be quite difficult to see. Yeah, and the next one, if you no, if you go down to the the wider site layout. That's the one. Okay, yeah, you're probably not going to see from from that, perhaps. Um, so at the moment, Bellinbrand doesn't have a footway at all. Um, there you go. You can just about see it now. You could you scroll down a little bit, Ian? There. So that that shows us access um, going on to Walters Road. Um, so you can see a footway is indicated there, going going all the way up, and then there's a, a crossing, uh, and then the footway carries on there's a single footway for the whole development which um uh, highways have not raised an objection to so in answer to the query that there's effectively an improvement because there's no footway currently in place for existing residents so so the proposal will will have a footway that serves the whole of the development going up to walters road um in relation to the, the paragraph you've you've picked up on that's paragraph in planning policy wales and obviously that that talks about this I mean, it's effectively talking about making sure there's sustainable access to to existing services um obviously the the developer in this instance can only do what they can do in terms of the um on site now what they're doing is they're they're providing a, a footway that will improve access onto the uh the local footway network and obviously there's a um in order to improve access to the site um, highways have uh, requested uh, section 106 contribution um, and that's that's recommended as well so so yeah the, the, we're we're satisfied in principle that, that it would be sustainable in, in that aspect um turn to the the acoustic barrier um you can see i mean as I, as i've said in the the officer report um the the application has been accompanied by a, a noise assessment which looks at the specific noise um, implications for the development from the M4 and, and the railway. So if, if you look on the um, right hand side of the, um, the the development red line, you can see a hatched area uh, and that's the area where the proposed acoustic barrier is. Now that could either be an embankment uh, or it could be an embankment with a, an acoustic fence above it. Above it. So there's, there's a condition that will allow scope for the design of that um, that barrier to be provided. Um, so it, it's dealt with under the condition, but it, it's got to be a, a certain um, a certain design in order to ensure that it is an effective barrier. So when details of that barrier are submitted, um, we will consult with the pollution control division to um, to ensure they're they're happy with it because they're they're the department who've actually. Uh, recommended a condition. Um, Ian, could you just scroll up on that image? So that you, you'll notice the hatched area um, sort of stops at a certain point. So from that point onward, um, the the barrier could be a, a fence uh, line going along the, the red line boundary. And what, what that fence will have to do, it will wrap around the side of uh, plot 20, which is the northernmost plot that you can see there. OK, so that's that's how close it will be. Uh, See the road and then you've got the turning point, the hammerhead on the top. What is it? There's no pavement on that road at all. So, so yeah, you, you can see a pavement on the well, it's in front of the properties. You can see there's a there's a it's footway. A yeah, there's a, there's a footway all all around that. Um, that hammerhead. Oh, the black, the thick black line. Yeah, okay, that's I was mixing up with the red line. Yeah, that's all right. Okay. Sorry, can I come back? Because it was my question. Um, I'm concerned now seeing the uh, acoustic fence sort of peters out, I think, by number uh, 13. <laughs> well, unlucky for some. Uh, and then you said it could just be a fence. 
but the houses at that end of the site are the closest to the motorway. You've got the amenity site between the others, or amenity space between the others, and yet now we're talking about just putting a fence. Now, sorry, but a fence in my mind is not a protective barrier because especially if it's a wooden fence and not maintained, that is extremely, from looking at this, obviously, close to the motorway. So I can't understand why an acoustic bank or whatever bund and the fencing can't go right the way up and wrap around to number 20 because they're practically sitting on the motorway when you look at this image and i did ask a question as well about the car parking alongside the houses which i hope you'll address uh, in a minute or whoever's going to do it thank you yeah th thanks um so ju just to clarify i mean that the the embankment is shown up to a certain point um, you know, there, thereafter, the, the site sort of narrows. So, effectively, what they're what they're showing is that a fence could be used instead of of a, of a fence and an embankment. So, as I said, there's a condition on the permission, and this this is also um, the condition in effect derives from what was found within the acoustic report, is that there, there does need to be a barrier of some design proposed. So and that has to hit a certain design standard. So that that's set out specifically within the condition in the permission. So I appreciate your concerns in terms of you, you don't believe a fence would would be acceptable, but they, in principle, they can design a, an embankment or or a specific acoustic fence um, that that can serve um, that can be an appropriate barrier in acoustic terms. And and as I said that would need to be submitted and approved by the local planning authority in consultation with, with the council's pollution control section. So we're, we're satisfied um, in principle having regard to the advice of the pollution control section and the, the information submitted within the, the applicant's acoustic report that, um, that they can address the, 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 the noise from the M4. And, and in fairness, I mean, that, that image uh, the, the site plan doesn't show that the, um, the screening vegetation that's between the, the site and the M4, which is, is quite a strong sort of uh, vegetation screen there. But, uh, you know, certainly acknowledge your concerns, but I, I think it's it has been dealt with in the report and, and the conditions. Um, in terms of the... the sorry, can I, sorry, <laughs> that's a bit, uh, you know, I've been on planning a very long time and over 20 years and I know that a small detail can get overlooked and I appreciate what you're saying and it's in the report about the acoustic fence, but if you look at the top of it, there's no uh, planting vegetation, uh, so we can see a couple of trees, but where the road goes up to the hammerhead, there's hardly anything at all. The most dangerous part and the most noisiest part is that part of the site. And if there are young children going to be living in those properties, then I'm sorry, we want to know categorically, not to... Uh, you know, just so that they can put a fence. I'm worried just that it's going to be a wooden fence, which can be construed as a barrier. And I want to make sure that it is there in the report that it is like safe and secure and that it's not going to be able to be knocked down or broken or whatever um, with a child running at it or whatever. So I'm sorry to leave the point, but I have been around and we've seen things that have got missed over the years. So I don't doubt your integrity. I just know things do slip and happen and there's nobody there to check them. No, that that's fine. So in, in terms of just hope, hopefully providing the, the clarification you're looking for, um, it's condition nine of the report. And I, I'll, I'll just read it to you just, just so you're aware of, of what it says. And, and as I said, we will consult with um, with pollution control when those details are submitted. Um, so what it says is prior to the occupation of any dwelling hereby approved, in accordance with the recommendations set out within section six of the report produced by Acoustics and Noise Limited, details of an acoustic barrier at the eastern extent of the site and extending around the rear boundary of plot 20 and a barrier on the southern boundary of plot one shall be submitted to and approved in writing by the local planning authority. The barrier shall be a minimum of three metres in height with a minimum superficial mass of 20 kilograms per square metre. In relation to plot one, an acoustic barrier shall be constructed to a minimum height of 1.8 metres 
with a superficial mass of 15 kilograms per square meter. The barriers shall be constructed in accordance with the approved details prior to the occupation of any dwelling hereby approved and shall be retained as approved for the lifetime of the development. So, so that's the, it, it's quite a detailed condition um, that's been um, drawn up and the pollution control section are, are, are happy that the that a, a barrier can be produced, designed and produced, installed, um, that will address the noise issues that have been uh, have been assessed within the report, um, and that can mitigate any excessive noise arising from the development. Now, I, I, you know, it's not going to prevent all the noise from the development, um, and as you know, we've been quite clear in the report that when you are there, you can hear the motorway noise. But it, it, what that barrier will do is it will mitigate it to to an acceptable level. OK. Um, in terms of the parking, it, Ian, you just, could you just um, sort of zoom in and perhaps a bit more just so you can see? So um, the, the designs of, uh, has evolved um, since the initial submission of the application. That there, there was frontage parking proposed when the application was first submitted, but we were concerned about that in terms of um, just the street scene. So, so the parking has been designed to be tucked to the sides of the dwelling. Um, you know, I, you know, it's set out in the report. We're, we're satisfied that um, it doesn't form a cramped form of development, and it's um, it's a fairly sort of uh, suburban layout, if you like. So, uh, you know, we're happy in in placemaking terms with the the parking provision that's proposed. Um, we've already chatted about about the buses, um, and in terms of the the sort of sustainable location of the site, as as is referenced in the report, um, it's right next to the Swansea Vale Strategic Development Site, um, which is within the the LDP as a strategic site. Um, there are schools and facilities in, in relatively close proximity to the site. Um, Ian's showing just there the, um, the site in context to the Swansea Vale site. So, I mean, as we've said, whilst the Swansea Vale comprehensive plans for the Swansea Vale site haven't come forward uh, to date, it is there as, a, as an allocation. Um, um, so, so, you know, the, the council is satisfied that within this broad area, we, we can see a significant number of houses together with new community facilities. So that's that's the vision for the area. So, you know, I, I mean, it's set out in the report that there were concerns in terms of the isolated character, but when, when you actually look at the site, the, the surrounding facilities and, you know, the, the council's vision for how this area can be developed, we're, we're satisfied that um, it, it is a relatively sustainable location or is capable of being, being made a sustainable location. Um, in, in terms of the flooding, um, yeah, it, it's all set out the, in the report in terms of um, how we've assessed it, uh, and it, it is an unbalanced decision. Um, you know, but the the events that we're talking about are are extreme flooding events, one in a hundred year events, one in a thousand year events. Um, it's got to be considered against those standards, um, and we're satisfied that um, you know that the consequences of flooding at this site would not be significant. Um, Councillor Tribe's comment was just about the how the the site uh, Bell and Brown actually connects to, to Walters Road, I think. Um, so it doesn't directly come out onto Tregov Village. Uh, so the sort of access to Tregov Village is a bit further up. Um, Ian, perhaps if you could show the, um, the first slide. I think that shows the development in context with the, the Swansea Vale Resource Centre. I think it's the very first slide. Frozen. <laughs> OK, thank you. Yeah, once once yeah, effectively once you once you're over the railway, once you've gone past the railway bridge, the, the Swansea um Swansea Vale access is, is is the next turning. Yeah. It's it's a bit clearer now, thank you. Oh, here we go. There we go. So yeah. 
you can you can see the Swansea Vale Resource Centre. Um, yeah, just to the south there. So it, it, once you pass the Wherry Bridge, you're effectively heading into Tregolf then. I think that was everything, but uh, feel free to correct me. Yeah, thanks, Simon. That's what I got on my list anyway. Uh, got no other hands up? Oh, Councillor Keaton, sorry. Of course, sorry. Sorry, Chair. Um, it, about the SUDs, what sort of SUDs will be in place? Didn't catch that. No, so, so there, there is a drainage section in the officer report. Um, effectively, there's there'll be some drainage basins proposed within the um, the area on the opposite side of the road. Um, so th those are those will be subject to consideration separately by the by the SAB. Um, but effectively, yeah, it's it's an attenuated um, surface water discharge to a local water course. That's what's proposed. Okay. Hey, thank you. No, thanks. No, thanks. No hands up to speak. I can't say any. OK, so if that's the case, and you can see the uh, recommendation is to approve the application. So we'll take that vote now, then, please. Okay, hey, uh, Councillor Phil Downen. For. Councillor Jeffrey. For. Councillor Mary Jones. Against. Councillor Keaton. Uh, for. Councillor Mike Lewis. For. Councillor Richard Lewis. For. Councillor Matthews. For. Councillor Tribe. For. Councillor Williams. For. And Councillor Lloyd. And for. Okay, that's you. Um, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Yeah, nine, four, one against. That's carried. Thank you very much. And then. It was 9 1, am I right, Alison? Yeah, thank you. And that concludes the meeting, and uh, our next meeting is the 14th of May. Thank you all very much.